Today we're going to do the eye. How many of you have seen this movie about three, four years ago called Lucy? A few, okay. So for those that don't, haven't seen it, Lucy is about someone that for, uh, I won't explain why, just in case you go see it, um, ingests too much drugs. And as a consequence, she starts using 100% of her brain neurons. Now, you've heard stories that you only use a small percentage of your neurons, okay? Um, and, and the rest you never use. But she gets to use 100% and she develops superpowers, okay? She can move buildings. So, um, let's, what do you think? Um, if uh, you could use 100% of your brain, you'd be able to do amazing things like Lucy, or would you faint? Or you, would you become tired? So all we have, uh, we don't have pictures in this class, but we have your hands, okay? So, all in favor of answer A, hit the table as hard as you can. No one, no one thinks that we like Lucy, eh? Okay. B, you will become tired. Oh, okay, that's a, a goodly number of you. Finally, uh, you would faint. I think that's slightly louder than the previous ones. And those are correct. You would faint. We don't use, in fact, it looks like we, we use something like 1 or 2 percent. of. We only activate 1 or 2 percent of our brain cells at once. Because running the brain is very and a very expensive proposition. We pump like 20 percent of our blood supply to the brain all the time, okay? That's, the, the brain is about the size of my fist here, okay? So this tiny little thing is being pumped with all this uh, blood and oxyg oxygenated blood coming right from the heart. Surprisingly, it's being channeled only to those areas that are involved in the task that you're at, so it's not, not going to the whole brain. It just shifts from area to area to area as the areas change, depending on what you're doing. So it's very um, um, conservative in how it uses this precious oxygen. And as a consequence, it's very efficient. So for example, a Mac uses something like that. This Mac in front of me is about 150 watts, which is like three light bulbs, your old standard light bulbs. Um, but the brain uses only a small fraction of that, 20 watts. So that, that, that's important. So how is it that the brain can do all it does, now do what, what most computers can't do? Uh, with so few active neurons. So it's not that we don't uh, use all your brain cells. You use them all, but not at the same time. Okay? Being switched from area to area. And what we'll do is what, that's what we'll, we'll be working on for a large part of the course. Um, the eye is as I said before, uh, a, a good example of what the brain is because um, in the fetus, it's an extrusion from the brain. And if you look into the retina, um, it, it's a window into the brain. So the eye is your window into the world, but it's also a doctor's window into your brain. And they're developing now tools 
to look at the retina and determine if you have Alzheimer's. Um, the only way to tell if you have Alzheimer's is to, uh, previously, is to drill a hole in your skull and take a sample from your actual brain uh, and see if you have plaques and things like that. And that's rarely done invasively. Um, but now they're developing tools that look into the eye and determine those factors. Now, how does the eye work? Well, you can see here that you have lenses that focus the, the, uh, the scene that's in front of you onto the back of the eye, which is the retina. And the retina is where all the cells, your actual brain cells, are located. And they transform this, this um, energy from the light waves into uh, electrical waves that travel down the optic nerve to the rest of the brain. Now, at the front of the eye, you have two lenses. One is a fixed lens. That's the outside of the cornea. And behind the, that is a flexible lens. And it's like, like a, a disc. And it's attached through these springs to a muscle. And this muscle, there's, this is two ends of it, but it's like a donut. We've cut through the donut here. It completely surrounds the lens in the middle. And these muscles are what contract and change the shape. So you can see here the shape, the, the shape changing. The crazy thing about this is when it contracts, you can see it's becoming uh, thicker, and that's the contracted part. This donut gets smaller, and as a consequence, it exerts less uh, sort of elastic pull on the lens itself. And when it becomes uh, less pull, the lens becomes rounder. When you contract, the lens becomes rounder. When it relaxes, these springs pull harder and it becomes flatter. Now, my daughter made this animation for me. I think it's kind of neat. You can see here um, the eye and the lens from the side as well as the muscle. And here you can see the muscle as the, this donut that pulls on the lens through these springs. And you can see when the lens is brown like here, if something close is focused on the retina. When it's flat, something distant is focused on the retina. Now, many of you uh, have or will have at some point in time glasses. And so you have um, something that needs correction, those glasses. Correct the, the focus onto your retina. And your glasses can be uh, like this, concave, or like this, convex. And the reasons for the glasses can be one of two reasons. One of, this, one of it is the shape of the eye. The shape of the eye can be different in different people. Here it's too long, and here it's too short. The other thing that can happen is your lens here can be not flexible enough or too flexible. As a consequence, it becomes too round 
and focus in front of the eye, or too flat and focus behind the eye. So if either of these things occur, either too long or too flat, too round, um, you need these type of lenses. You need lenses that will push it further back into the eye, push the focal point. If the opposite happens, then you need these type of lenses, convex lenses, and you're called farsighted because you can see far, but you can't see near without the glasses. Now, when you become old, like me, you're, you've got a problem. Your lens becomes stiffer. So even when I try to focus on something near to make my lens round, it stays too flat. You can see here that this lens stays flatter than the normal lens. And as a consequence, I need glasses to read something like a newspaper. So a little test, again with clapping on the table. So let's say um, we've got this problem here. I can't read this newspaper. And you can see here that the thing, the focal point is behind the eye. What do I need? None is, this is what we, we get for none. So the two choices are convex or concave. Any, everyone for convex. Yes. Okay. Um, you can see a convex lens change the focal length so from behind the eye to the retina itself. The other visible part of the eye is your iris, this thing that changes the width of the hole through which uh, a, a light can enter the eye. And it does this because um, your receptors are sensitive to too much light. Um, often people wear sunglasses to help the this process out, but these th the eye becomes pupil becomes smaller when you're in a very well lit environment. The other thing it does, making pupil smaller, it focuses things on the back of the eye. Now here's a the uh, um a, a lens that focuses behind the eye. And the width here is the blur that you see. You can see that when, when you close the pupil up, the width of this becomes smaller. And so the blur becomes smaller. So change, changing your pupil size will brighten things up. That's why it's good to read in a very bright room lots of light. It makes the people smaller and you're capable of reading finer print. Okay, now we'll move into the back of the eye, the retina. And in the back of the eye, we find all these cells. There's layers of cells. You have a layer of photoreceptors. They're the ones that respond to light that's hitting them. And one type is shaped like cones. And they're the ones that are sensitive to different colors. You have three different types of cones. Uh, one's sensitive um, uh, to blue light, one sensitive to red light, and one sensitive to green light. And then 
in addition, we have rods. And again, the, 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 they have corresponding rod shape. And they respond to um, various shades of black and white, various shades of gray. They're not, they, they, there's only one type, so they can't distinguish between um, the different colors. Then over here is the ganglion cell, and that's the only output from the eye. These ganglion cells are the ones that find their way to the optic nerve and then to the brain. In between, we have one thing, we have these bipolar cells, which go from the receptors. These, these receptors, in this case, is a comb, but it could very well be a rod. And they connect that to the ganglion cell. We also have things like horizontal cells, and they connect several receptors to this bipolar cell. So there could be, in this case there's two, but there could be hundreds of receptors connecting to the ganglion cell, to, through this bipolar cell, by way of horizontal cell. The other thing is these amacrine cells. They basically do the same thing, but uh, they do it for more peripheral rods. So um, we'll see that there's a concentration difference of rods and cones. Now the remarkable thing about the, uh, your, your um, cones or rods is they, they respond differently to light than you might expect. When light comes on, the potential drops. When light, the light comes on, the potential drops. Light goes off, the potential rises. So it's just as if dark is the stimulus for the eye. It's, it's not what you might posit at first. Now, some endocrine cells um, and all ganglion cells use action potentials. Okay. Um, I, I don't know how many remember from three, um, three, three, three thousand and hundred. It's called now. It used to be three ten. They added a zero. Um, or for previous courses, they take an action potentials are sort of these potentials that go down the axons of the cells. To, to come talk to other cells. Um, the other, all the other cells use graded potentials. Okay, so their the potential to go up or go down. You know, no action potentials. Now the reason um, action potentials are good because they can travel a large distance, but they also have a problem. Like watch here, let's say, can you tell if the rate of the action potential is increasing or decreasing? Notice how you have to wait till you see the next action potential to, to tell if the rate has decreased. So you have to wait the distance between two action potentials. And most cells fire something like either 10 times or 1,000 times per second. So they're not instantaneous. Okay? So you have to wait at least uh, 1,000 of a second to know if things have gotten, or the brain has to wait 1,000 of a second at least, or maybe a tenth of a second, if something's getting brighter or dimmer. The graded potentials, on the other hand, change instantaneously. You don't have to wait. So they transmit information rapidly. 
The disadvantage is that greater potentials uh, can only propagate over a short distance, and all these cells are relatively close to each other, so that's not a problem. But ganglion, but particularly the ganglion cell, has to travel a long distance to get to the brain, so it has to convert to actual potentials, even though they have this disadvantage of not being instantaneous. Now, why is it difficult to read in low illumination? You notice we had a newspaper a second ago, and now this is by moonlight, and it's really hard to read, okay? There's two things that have changed. I don't know if anyone notices. The other thing, I'll just do this again, okay? Notice the colors disappear. Okay, everything is not only more difficult to read, but it's also you can, can't tell any color. You can ba barely see where the shape of the newspaper is. That's about it. Why is that? Why is it difficult to read by low, low illumination? Well, part one of the answer is that uh, the, the retina is in uniform. The fovea here contains only cones. The peripheral here contains mostly rods. These, that's the difference between these two areas. The other thing is that cones are less sensitive to light. Okay. Um, if you, some, I don't know if any of you tried this, but uh, if you go out in a starry night and you see a, 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 a dim star in your peripheral retina, you spot something there, when you look at it, it disappears. That, it, your fovea turns to it and it, those cones can't see it anymore. So your fovea is where you're cones that are located, and that's why that newspaper, when it became dark, you couldn't see any colors. The part, third part of the answer is that this peripheral part, as opposed to this foveal part, has less acuity. You can't see as clearly, so as, as accurately, or as in detail. So therefore, it's harder to read if this is the only part, you're only using the rods to read the newspaper. Why is that? Okay, why is it, why is the periphery not able to see clearly? Well, you can see these are examples of rods and cones in your peripheral retina. These are examples of cones in your fovea. You can see that these are bigger and also farther apart. These are small and close together. The other thing you can see is that many of these connect to a single ganglion cell, whereas over here, only a few connect to a single ganglion cell. As a consequence, this, because of large spacing and large convergence, you have a, a low acuity, you can't see detail. Whereas here, because of a, a, a small spacing and the low convergence, you can see things in high detail. So as a consequence, what you see by day is color in, and detail in your fovea, and you also activate the periphery, but it's not as detailed. Whereas in the dark, your fovea is blind, 
and you see only the grains or largely grains in your peripheral retina. Now, the, the other problem that you're going to solve is this is your whole retina. It's large. It contains lots and lots of cells. This thing is small. How do you get this big thing down this tiny little tube or nerve that goes out the optic nerve, called the optic nerve? Um, this phobia here is only about 2% of, uh, of what, what the eye sees. But it represents about half of the signal that travels down this optic nerve. So there are a lot more cells that, that are coming from this part here. A lot, of, a, lot, a lot finer information coming from this part here than that part over here. Okay. Um, one important com com concept that's um, sometimes difficult to get is what's called receptive fields. So, uh, receptive fields are can imagine them as the, what a neuron sees, or as you will see later, feels or hears. And it, 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 it we, we basically, uh, the process of converting your 100 million rods and cones into 1 million ganglion cells that go down the optic nerve. So, the receptive field of, let's say, the ganglion cell is all the cells here that feed this ganglion cell. Now, here we have um, a ganglion cell firing, and if we move the light over here, we see no change in its activity. So probably this gang, this rod is not connected to the ganglion cell. If we go here, we see a decrease in activity. That su suggests that maybe there is a connection. When we go here, there's an increase in activity. That also suggests that there is a connection. Here there's a decrease. Here we're back to where we were at the start. So it looks like these three neurons are connected to this ganglion cell. So the change that can happen to determine the receptor field is either uh, an increase or a decrease. This concept of receptor field is important because it applies not only to uh, vision, but it applies to all your senses. Um, for, in the case of touch, uh, instead of a retina, you have the skin that you deal with. All the receptors are your skin. You'll see in the auditory system that it's a, a, a little ribbon of cells that, that, that this is responsible. So all of them have receptive fields. Now, in the eye, we have two flavors. One with on center and off surround. So you can see here, there's pluses in the middle and minuses all around. And these ta cells tell you whether something is lighter in the center. Okay? These cells here are the opposite. They're off center, on surround. So you can see in the middle, they're all negative. In the surround, they're all positive and they tell you that something is darker. Um, so, the way that the, the, they did these experiments early 
is that the recorded from a ganglion cell and then this mouse here was something that was a small point of light that looked to see what would happen. So they noticed that as we approached here, all of a sudden they got an increase in activity. And then as we moved further in, we got a decrease below the rate at which it was firing initially. And then an increase again, and then back to our background level. So what do you think we have here? What kind of cell do we have? Remember what the sequence was? First, there was an increase, then if we went further, come on, ah, a decrease. It's hard to find this thing. <laughs> it's, it's somewhere over here, there's a field, it's all negative, and somewhere over here, it's all positive. It is. Okay. Can anybody tell me? It's an off center. Okay. Because we, here, you can see we went from the outside, it went first positive, and then negative, and then positive again. And that's the way they, they, they map these cells. They run around with little pots, spots of light and said, okay, this is a, an offset of this is not, and they can figure out what each ganglion cell did. Besides the ones we described up to now, there's also these kind. Here we turn the light on, and you notice the activity goes up, but then gradually comes back down to its resting level. And then when we turn the light off, it goes off completely and then gradually goes off to its uh, resting level. So these are phasic ones, phasic ganglion cells, and they detect changes. The next question is, how did these receptor fields form? So you can see here, changes in activity by this bar rising. So this is light in the center. Light in the center. Okay. Goes down when you hit a receptor. Then this is a negative connection. So the, the, this cell does the opposite. It goes up. When this is with a positive connection, so this also goes up. So this is an inhibitory uh, synapse. This is an excitatory synapse. And the best way of figuring this out is, is rather than decrease, act, decrease or increase of transmitter is every time you have a, a negative sign, an inhibitory receptor, the opposite happens. Every time you have a positive sign, the same happens. So this is the way uh, this cell is an on center because this is, produces, this, this potential goes down, it's an inhibitor receptor, so this potential goes up, and so does this. So it's an on center cell. Now we go put light on the periphery. In an on center cell, we should then decrease the activity in the ganglion cell. So you can see this receptor drop, this is positive, so this drops, this is an inhibitor connection, so this goes up, this goes, again, this inhibitor, this goes down, and this positive, and this goes down as well. So this light in the periphery caused 
this could go down, like right? so on center, off surround. Why do they do that? Well, uh, if you look at the paintings, it's an example from one a painting from Seurat. This, the function of this, on center, off surround, or vice versa, is to accentuate edges. Okay. You can see Seurat here. It's darker here and gets lighter, and then it, here it's darker and then it gets lighter again. You just accentuate the edge of the figure. He does this all over the place. To make the, the, the image stand out more. And the brain does the same thing. Okay, Neurons, this is a dark area, and this is a light area. This ganglion cell is all in the dark area. This ganglion cell is all in the light area. Both of them are sort of asleep. The, the positive and the negative balance, and so this thing is firing away at some low, uh, low rate of activity. And similarly, this cell. So both these guys that are far off the edge are essentially transmitting no information. The cells that do transmit information are those at the edge. This cell here is an on center, so it's telling the brain that this edge, part of the edge is lighter. This is an off center cell, so this cell is telling the brain that this part of the edge is darker. And you can see that the way it's doing it is, is this part of the receptive field is is in the light and this is in the dark. So this part here inhibits it, telling it it's a darker edge. So the question then is, um, how does the brain do all that does the self few neurons? Well, one of the ways is by this type of center surround mechanism. Uh, we saw that the only cells in that previous few slides, were the ones at the edge that were doing the action. The ones in the middle, all the other ones, all the other ganglion cells were sort of resting. One consequence of this is that you get these illusions. I think most of you should sense that this is a lighter gray than over here. And this is a darker gray than over here. In actual fact, all these, all this is the same uh, level of gray. This is lower, which is darker, and it's darker still. But the eye sees this. So a, a lighter at this edge, a darker at this edge. So you get these illusions caused by the brain's attempt to accentuate edges. Now the second function of this is constancy. If you take a piece of paper or newspaper that you read um, or your notes and read them in a darkened room, um, uh, there'll be something like this. So the whole page will be darker. The letters will be darker, and so will the page itself be darker. You go outside, you see something like this. The page is lighter, and the letters are lighter. But yet, the, the, the letters seem as black. This seems as, this is seen as black, and this is seen as white. This is seen as black, and this is seen as white. Where in actual fact, if you were to compare them instantaneously, this, this thing that you see outdoors, a letter here, the gray, is actually lighter than the page was when you saw it indoors. Okay. 
So how does black stay as black and white stay as black? White, white stay as white uh, for, for the different levels of illumination, indoors and outdoors. Well, it's the difference that counts. So the, these these uh, cells measure the difference between um, the center and the surround. So the, the, the difference is the same here and the same here. Okay, so black is black and white is white because the brain, the brain retina sees the difference. Okay, we get the color. Which tastes better? The ones you see in color or the ones you see in black and white? No. It's color that tells you whether things are right. And it, it's one of the advantages of having color vision is for you to be able to recognize what's edible and what's not edible. Now, if you have uh, um, a, a rod or cone, um, uh, it can detect wavelengths. But it, there's one wavelength that it activates better for. In this case, it's green light. So it's a cone that's sensitive to green. You have here all the other wavelengths that it's less sensitive to. Now, what would happen if you had just green cones and you saw this? Well, A is this blue and A is over here on your color bar. So this would activate the cell this much, your, your cone this much. This Orange, the B, that would be this point here. So that would activate this much, which is the same as that. So as a result, this object would be invisible in its background. That object being a bear would not be very good survival value. So most species have developed more receptors. And for example, here, when you have a red receptor, in addition to your green receptor, this red receptor allows you to tell a difference between this color, which is red over here, or red or orange over here, versus the, the background over here. So now you can see this object. So, but for some combinations because even a two phone system has can be fooled. And so most many species have like us have developed a three cone system. There are some others, like birds, for example, that have more than three. Now colors cones in themselves have a problem. They can't tell whether something is getting brighter, like this arrow here, or whether something changing in color, that's this arrow here. Both are going up, but you don't know why. Is it getting brighter, or is it getting uh, changing in color? And we'll see uh, in a moment that it takes these special neurons that are in your visual cortex, not your eye, that allow you to tell which it is. Okay. So, the other thing that's important is light is not like paint. Okay. When you mix light, it has a different result than mixing paint. For example, here, when you mix red with green, you get yellow. When you mix all the colors together, you get that white. Okay. You try mixing paint, all the colors of paint together, you get black, the opposite. Okay. So uh, that's a key difference 
from the light and faith. If you look in the eye, we have, in the fovea of the eye, we find these cones. And we find that the number of distribution of different types of cones isn't equal. And it, um, for example, here we have more red sensitive cones than all the others, uh, some green and fewer blue. Um, that the, 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 the cone distribution varies from person to person. The other thing you notice that it tends to form the clusters, these green cones here all together as they are over here. In the very, very center of the phobia, you only find two types of cones, green and red cones. The blue cones have disappeared. So that, that's the reason for that is that it, uh, the, 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 the lack of blue makes things even sharper. Uh, the distance between any two adjacent cones can be smaller than if you have your clutter with some blue cones. If you look at the peripheral retina, um, things have changed even more. What you find here is that you have mostly rods, a few cones, and both are bigger than, or both the, 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 the cones are bigger than the ones you found in, in the fovea. Uh, and and the, the further you go in the periphery, the bigger the rod become. And of course their density then goes down. Can you see a, a number here? Not here, but here. What's the number? Yeah, 10. Okay. If you can't see the number, two things can be. Either uh, the, this projector isn't very good at transmitting different colors, or you're colorblind. Now, there are several reasons you could be colorblind. Um, the, the, the pigments uh, that you have in the cones uh, are dependent on genetics. And uh, if you have deficit, one of your genes that produce these cones, you can be missing or have a defective uh, cones. You could have be missing one cone, so in the, each of these cases, one of the cones is missing. Or you can be missing two cones, or you can be missing all the cones, or you, the shape of this curve can be different from normal. One of these three things can result in color blindness. Now, suppose that you lost all three of your cones. The result would be, okay, but here we have this table banging exercise again. You will not be able to A, one number one, C, oh, C an apple. See in dim lights. Huh? Read. Right. Okay. Why is that? Well, see, no, because the rod, you still have the rod receptors. And so you can see with the rods. You won't be able to see in detail with the rods, but you will see, you'll see. See a red apple. No, the rods will still respond to a, a red light. Uh, so you'll see the apple, but you won't be able to tell whether the apple is still green or whether it's red. Um, you will be able to see in dim light because the, the rods are even more sensitive than your cones 
we're seeing in the in the right. But you, uh, you won't be able to read okay, because the rods are spaced far apart, and most often the letters that you read are tiny, and so you have difficulty making out what the letters are unless you brought the letter up really close to your eye. Okay, we have. Three types of cones, how many sort of shades can we distinguish? Well, the first thing we have is hues. So here we have like the rainbow drawn out in this, into a circle. And these are the different hues that we have. And you can separate about 200 different hues. So if you change it from this green to this green, you can tell a difference. If you make this difference smaller and smaller and smaller, you can detect about 200 differences all in all. Then you have different levels of saturation. So saturation is mixing light colors. Here we can see what happens at when you mix different shades <laughs> of green and this sort of violet color, reddish color. Um, and you can see that in the middle here, we get a combination of the two, and we get white. Okay. So these colors at the opposite ends, what's over here, through the center to here, are called complementary colors. And if you mix complementary colors, you always get white. If you mix non-complementary colors, like this shade of green with this shade of red, you get yellow. Finally, brightness. You can change how bright things are. You notice that after, if you change brightness to a high level of brightness, this gets smaller. That is, you're less able to distinguish very bright colors as you are able to less able to distinguish very dark colors. But all in all, there's about 500 different levels of brightness that you distinguish. So if you multiply all these things together, you get <laughs> 2 million different colors that the eye can detect, which is not bad, which is three cones. And usually monitors now uh, can, the old monitors could, used to be able to draw about three shades of color. Now they're up way beyond two million. And there's no reason to get better than two million because the human eye can't distinguish between anything more than two million. Okay, here's an interesting problem. Try to just look at the X and see what you see. Just keep looking at the white plus sign. It's hard to not get distracted. But I promise you, if you stare hard enough, you will be rewarded. How many of you see a purple uh, light flashing. Okay. How, in how many of you did the yellow dots totally disappear? Oh, come on, you want to try it. If you try hard enough, you'll, you'll come up, to, you'll get to a point where you can't see any yellow, and all you can see is a purple dot flashing. The surprising thing is that there is no purple dot left. How many believe that? Okay. <laughs> Good. And I'll show you why. Okay. 
So this is what's supposed to happen. Is that, 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 that eventually, the, the, you, at first you see just the purple dot flashing, then eventually the yellow dot disappear, and all you see is the purple dot. You might see have seen a similar effect here if you stare just at one fruit. When it turns dark, you might start seeing colors in the fruit and colors in the other fruits as well. The important thing is don't move your eye. Just keep staring at the same point, the same fruit. Okay? So this is, this is a similar effect. So this is because your cones gradually adapt to the same color. What's interesting to see is which color that is. So again, look at the X and then without moving your eye, uh, see what you can see around, you know, what, what's left over. So what's left over of the green, for example, or better still, What's left over of the blue, it's easier to tell the blue. But don't move your eyes. You know, stay looking at the X and see what happens to where the blue spot was. How many can see that yellow light? Yeah. Good. So it looks like there's a pattern. If you study it carefully, you'll find that the red leaves this, this color, called cyan. The green li li leaves this magenta or purple color. And the yellow leaves a blue. And why is that so? It appears that you're working with some sort of push-pull system. So uh, red and cyan are push-pull systems. So one, one is pushing and the other is pulling. And similarly for the other colors. Now, how does this happen? Well, in your retina, you have cones. We saw that you had on-center and off-center um, receptor fields. Well, you also have receptive fields with cones, and some cones have uh, positive in, in inside and negative inside for a particular color or the opposite. Okay. But there's only one of, they're called opponent cells because there's just one, whatever is here inside has the opposite on the outside. In the cortex, not in the eye, you have these things called double opponents. Now you can see here that you've got blue here, which has the positive effect. But in the periphery, it has the opposite effect. We've got red and green here, which has a negative effect. But in the periphery, it has a positive effect. Now think about this. If you have white light shone in the center, you'll not, you'll activate this and this, okay, and you'll knock out both. And the same thing will happen in the periphery. We'll also find sort of red and magenta double opponent cells. Now what happens, what happened in that, um, experiment. So let's see, let's suppose we shone a yellow dot okay, for a long time. Then we had the circle of those yellow dots. If you shone it for a long time, you'd adapt these two guys up here. Okay? They have this negative effect. But you wouldn't adapt these because blue is not a sensitive to yellow. So as a consequence, when you took both these, these off, you, 
went to gray or white, this will be affected less, this will be affected more, and they will light up your cortex, and you will see blue, which is what you saw in that experiment, that when the yellow went off, you saw blue. So you've got these opponent things. We have a yellow-blue uh, opponent thing, and we have uh, this green-purple opponent thing. And in fact, you have can have opponent things all the way around. Any any um, thing that goes through the center is the opponent of the opposite one. So you go back to this example. You can see the purple up here. And why? Is it because uh, there's a rotating blue dot? No, there's no rotating blue dot. Is the yellow dot dimming late in the scene? Nope, that's not why it disappears. Um, the yellow dot is briefly turned off in sequence. That's all that happens, okay? All I do here is turn off the yellow dot. And if I keep staring at the center, that is adapting the same sets of neurons, gradually these sets of neurons, uh, the red and green cones, uh, get ad adapted out. And when they go off, you see the blue. Okay, so um, what combination of colors will maximally activate a double opponent cell? Let's see what this opponent cell in the center, what happens to it in the center. Yellow here seems to turn it down. Blue seems to turn it up. What happens in the periphery? Blue seems to turn it down, and yellow seems to turn it way up. So this opponent cell is sensitive to blue in the center and yellow in the surround. So uh, the two of them ex accentuate one another. And it is for this reason that I'm wearing a blue shirt with a yellow tie today. Uh, you won't see me with, with a tie ever again. I do this for the first lecture only. This is my special yellow tie that I've had for years. The other thing that happens is that if you just shine any color light on the, a, a double opponent cell, it's not affected. You know, if you just shine on the center and the surround, um, they, they don't light up, okay? So red is always red, and, and blue is always blue, independent of what shade is there throughout the room. So um, an apple seems like a red apple during daytime or at sunset. It's the same shade of red. Okay, because the, 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 the shade that's there throughout the scene is not visible. It's the difference again that's visible. Okay, in summary then, the eye sees three things, does three things. It focuses the light from the, the outside onto different places on the retina. It detects light of various colors and intensities and compresses this information and sends it to the brain so that you, the brain gets information something like this. Things from the center in color and lots of detail and things from the surround 
in grays and less detail. Now it seems, it might seem to you that this, this so this is the result of compression, compressing the information that's coming from this big retina into this tiny little optic nerve. And this is what you see. And yet, all of you are seeing the world vividly. Why is this? Well, we'll start discovering this in the next lecture. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much.